Give Me That Old Time Religion by Richard Doakey Narrated by Thomas Rose Brian Lair, the clerk said. What kind of name is Brian Lair? What kind of name? It's my name. I'm sorry, sir, the clerk said. All I meant was I've never seen it spelled that way. Is it German? It sounds German to me. I'm very interested in genealogy. Everyone should know where they come from, wouldn't you agree? Anyway, Mr. Lair, congratulations. This phone puts you in touch with the world. Sell it to me, then, Brian Lair said. The world's a big place. Yes, sir, the clerk replied. The man behind him peered over Brian Lair's shoulder and frowned. Others were in line, all with the face that happens when you think about nothing, and nothing thinks about you. There, the clerk said. The paperwork is done, and here's your copy. Mr. Lair, you now own the most advanced personal communications device on the planet. The phone was flat, shiny smooth, and jet black, a pretty thing the size of a four-by-six card or an open wallet. It cost eleven hundred without the insurance. He considered the perverse pleasure of dropping it. He put the phone into his pocket and stepped away. The line bumped forward one life. Outside the air was brisk, the sky was clear, the forecast for rain misguided as usual. If they couldn't predict with certainty tomorrow's weather, how could they predict how much warmer the world would be ten years from now, or cooler for that matter? No one knows anything about tomorrow, he thought, so why get exercised when tomorrow isn't what you expect? It was Saturday, and that meant one of those hateful cocktail parties Barbara dragged him to at Myrna Malloy's apartment, or anyone else's apartment. He almost came to blows last weekend at Myrna's with Henry Peterson of Peterson, Peterson, and Putts. He called the third partner Frank Parker Putts because Frank Parker was a Putts. Henry was a global warmer. Henry owned a silver Tesla. Henry had his suits made at Melchior's on West Montgomery. Henry owned an expensive town house and a summer home at the lake. There was no need to own more, but Henry needed more, so now Henry owned the world in a kind of metaphorical timeshare with everyone else at the parties. Henry was hell-bent to save the world piece by piece, paper, plastic, glass, all in separate bins. Wind farms were a big thing with Henry Peterson. Solar panels across rooftops are stuffed into acres of arable land. They were big with Henry, too. Everyone at the parties saw things the way Henry saw them, which made everyone feel good about everyone except anyone who wasn't there. Such collective concern justified flights to Bermuda or the Bahamas or to the thatched cottages of Maui. Henry Peterson was a good person. One could tell that right off by listening to Henry. Myrna Malloy, she was a good person, too, as were the Merryweathers, Tom and Marlene Condon, Peter Albright, who was chasing around now with Ellen Gilchrist after Ellen's nasty divorce, George Costa and his wife Bernice, and Jerry Brownlow and his wife Shirley. All of them were good persons, in agreement about evil, which received no invitation to any party. Nested with cocktails and bean dip, petted by soft violins and muted horns from the bows, woofers, and tweeters beneath a heavily draped window, they swept the dust away and spoke about a dreamed-of cleaner world where vile men who liked Ronald Reagan were not in charge, and there was no need for gossipy intolerance. Henry Peterson was a good man, but not morally so, to Brian Lair's thinking, because Henry was permissive about everything, and judgmental only when it came to the sanctity of the earth. Henry had faith in the ground he stood upon and the air he breathed. He sorted refuse. He was a member of the Sierra Club. But he was still Henry Peterson, standing by the piano, 
humorless, like the others, unless they laughed at someone who wasn't there. Henry saw the irony in nothing he believed in, because Henry did not see the irony of believing in anything. And what was he, Brian Lair, anyway, but an irony in his own mind? They wanted to make him Republican so they could know what to think. But he was no Republican, or Independent, or anything politically, and allowed as much, which confused Henry and the rest, because there was no bin to put him in. Brian Lair wondered and wondered. More or less, they were assholes. It was the only word. He couldn't help using it. But good assholes, in their own minds, who were not to be confused with real assholes who voted for cutting taxes and building the wall. Henry cared about big things, and what was bigger than the whole damn planet. So Saturday nights came, and Henry Peterson knelt with his friends. They prayed, and they cared, reflected in the mirrors of similar eyes across the rims of similar martinis. Henry Peterson wanted to punch Brian Lair because Brian would not accept the grace offered him at the altar where they all worshipped. So he was tolerated, Brian was. He had married Barbara Helsted after Barbara's first husband, Bill, skipped off with his legal secretary. And weren't Bill and Barbara signature members of the Church of Good Earth which gathered at Myrna's, or Edna's, or the Higginses, or the Johnsons, or wherever services were held, and denied the death of God by dreaming of a green resurrection which certainly was in their power to initiate, because the earth was common property and might be saved if they all repented and agreed upon the proper rituals of life? Terrorists of truth, Brian called them. They marched forward in a jihad of personal redemption. It did no good for him to insist upon logic, to point out that consensus was no determiner of fact, that science could be cooked like spaghetti even when the recipe was bad or the ingredients were deliberately ill-chosen, that a consensus of scientists had once believed the world flat in the center of the universe, and that the edge of the sea marked the infernal region. Did belief make something flat or the center of anything? Did it make the sun burn out in fire and steam? Wasn't there a difference between satellite data and ground monitors? Weren't the computer models cooked in a bad oven? And how about Einstein? Wasn't it old Albert himself who said that even one scientific doubt must be reconciled with E equals MC squared, or else E equals MC squared was false? Since when was truth measured by containers, one for glass, one for cans, one for saran, any more than running a Tesla on electricity up to Bodega Bay qualified one to be a deacon in the Church of Good Earth? Henry Peterson clenched his fist, it was true, he clenched it, and glared at Brian when Brian said that about Albert Einstein. The terrorists of truth cursed him and called him a denier. Brian Lair was German, his parents were German, and all his relatives German. So what? So he bit his lip, sipped his dry martini, nibbled his green olive, covered his stone ground crackers with bean curd or crab dip, and was as a pair of claws scuttling across the bottom of an empty sea. Silence was salvation. On the wall of Myrna's apartment were prints in black and white of Half Dome, Big Sur, and the sun sinking into the black oblivion beyond the Golden Gate. Who needs the aggravation of denial, so that if it came right down to it and he raised his voice and lifted his chin, might not Barbara Lair herself, nee Barbara Helsted, put a torch to the kindling at his feet? Everyone wondered what did Barbara ever see in Brian Lair in the first place, and Barbara, with so many like-minded friends who remained like-minded in spite of Bill Helsted and Bill Helsted's secretary. And sometimes in those early days at Myrna's, just after the marriage with Barbara, at the Tanners's or the Higgins's or the wherever, he thought that Barbara must have wondered as much herself. He saw something in her face when she struggled to pay attention to what he said, when truly what she wanted to hear was what anyone else was saying. He was apprehensive later in bed when he saw a face and wondered, was it love he saw shadowed in her eyes? 
or only the need to be loved. Brian Lair squeezed the thing in his pocket. He recalled the old keypad phone on his desk and the convenience of call waiting. He recalled the dial phone of infancy, a black funky thing with a neck like a stork, a cradle, and a black ice cream cone to stick against the ear. He thought of long before phones and his grandmother who wrote letters and waited weeks for a reply and of everywhere how people went on horseback or in a boat blown by the wind. He hated needing the phone because he needed it the way he had needed last year's phone and the phone before that. He needed it for business. He needed it for groceries when he forgot Barbara's list. He needed it stuck out maybe on a country road late at night miles from AAA. Machinery did that with a man, and he hated machinery. No, 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 he didn't truly hate machinery. He didn't hate electricity, indoor plumbing, and ice cubes. He hated the convenience of needing everything because everything was so damned convenient. He hated the phone because he had to have it. He was not nostalgic for some pastoral time with oxen and hand-hewn cabins, no light bulbs, no hot water, no supermarket two blocks down, no interstate to Montana and rainbow trout and everything to do because there was no convenience about doing anything. He had watched those documentaries about men who homestead life off the grid far from Amazon.com and Best Buy off somewhere in Alaska. No roads, no restaurants, no cigar shops, no theater, no Saturday night parties. No anything. Just out there freezing your ass, chopping your wood, hunting your food. No shower, no carpet, no three-gallon toilet. Just out there where everything is. Must it all be lost to have it all back again? He had tried one Saturday night early on to explain. They said, hell, if that's the way you feel, go live out somewhere. Buy an island like Marlon Brando. Explore the woods like Lewis and Clark. And you say you don't understand that the earth is getting warmer and you don't see why? Henry Peterson clenched his teeth at such blasphemy and raised the sword above his head. Brian Lair stood on the sidewalk. People were in line at the store. Those outside held the thing that he held in his pocket. They played and giggled and tapped. They bumped into each other, tapping and tapping under the blue, intangible sky. Don't sweat it, Brian, he thought. Don't flail and decry crowded intersections, jacked-up stereos in low-slung automobiles with tinted glass, cocktail parties with similar-minded people so dissimilar from what they have no mind for. Couples in restaurants, tapping and tapping, the pearlescent dance of light tapping every window, window after window, every night, along every neighborhood street. Ever finer and finer life was lived as it had not been lived before. Ever more somber was the work of memory. Already there was talk of metal men. Already they were implanting living flesh with factory parts. They were padding light posts and stop signs to protect those who speak by satellite. People slept with their phones. They defecated with their phones. They committed coitus interruptus to answer their phones. How could the need of any instrument be as needful as the need for love? He removed the hand from his pocket. The sun was on his face. He felt the absolute coldness of that separate greater grinding and the beckoning from the Church of Good Earth, its promise of deepened friendship with Henry Peterson, the deeper love of Barbara Lair, nay Barbara Helstead, whose husband Bill ran off with his legal secretary, and, most precious, the belief and belonging that make one whole again. He stood on the sidewalk, blinking into the sun, and thought, The earth warms. The earth cools. The earth knows what to do. But what about me? What about me?